F. Roberts, what kind of what's your first film? I'm very curious, even though I know what they are, but I'm not sure who what you'll select first. Well, um, my first film, uh, let me preface it by saying that there's one author I don't mention enough, but I absolutely love him, and that's Chester Himes. Oh, yeah. Uh, and the real deal. Uh huh. Now I had seen a previous I had seen I had previously seen a film adaptation of uh his Harlem crime novels called A Rage in Harlem, which I yeah, think was made back in the late nineties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I personally did not care for, but I didn't either all that much. But uh, it. <laughs> it may be it may be well made, I guess, but uh, you know, you know, Forrest Whitaker cer- certainly nothing to sneeze at. But at the same time, yeah, I didn't care for it mainly because it seemed to take uh, his two detective characters, Gravedigger Jones and Coffin Ed Johnson, and basically turn them into periodic walk-ons, which kind of made no sense to me. You know what? Until and, uh, you mentioned it just now, I didn't even remember they were characters in that movie. There were characters in the movie, but you barely knew who, were they, who they were unless you were familiar with uh, Chester Himes. <laughs> um, you know, just yeah, you occasionally hear grave digger, blah blah blah, and uh, but yeah, it was just it's kind of like they're just basically almost like background characters that popped up every half hour or so. But um, someone else did that movie very well for MGM, and that was uh, Ossie Davis, who co wrote and directed cotton comes to harlem and this was absolutely banging what uh, year was that it's 1970 i believe so what ossie davis was probably the third black man after uh gordon park senior and Melvin man peebles to direct a hollywood movie and i think uh-huh. ossie davis did direct another movie before that like a drama but i'm not sure but anyway i'm i'm, I'm stepping on your your territory man no, that's cool. Now, the thing I remember Ossie Davis from very much back in the day, you know, he uh, he's played a million roles in a million kinds of movies. Yeah. Uh, the one that I remember him the most from is, you know, the Demare character in uh, Do the Right Sweet. Thing. Mm-hmm. But I think that, uh, but kind of the thing that I first remember him from was back in the early 70s that's when cool. he and his wife, Ruby D hosted a show produced and hosted a show on PBS called Say Brother, which, uh, you know, is very much like kind of a revolutionary, you know, African-American kind of activist show. Wow, I'd love to see that. I saw that show. I sat and watched that show when I was a little kid. I didn't understand most of what they were talking about, but I just kept watching and I thought, okay, whatever they're talking about, it's good. Right. And, uh, (laughs) but... But, uh, yeah, I just, but so he co-wrote and directed that and there was a sequel to that movie mm-hmm. called something like Comeback Blue Charleston, which I guess. Come Back refused. Charleston Blue. Come Back Charleston Blue. That's right. Which yeah. he had nothing to do with, I guess, basically because, uh, uh, which one, which one of the main big heads of MGM was still around at that time. Oh, I can't remember this dastard's name off the top of my head. It was, uh. Metro Goldwyn Mayer. Mm-hmm. That was the other guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, but great, great flick. Um, I Cotton Comes to Harlem is not one of the books I read, but kind of going over the synopsis, the movie seems very faithful to it. Uh, it's got a great supporting cast. Uh, Red Fox is fantastic. It, Cleavon Little has a very small role in it. Um, uh, Deke O'Malley, uh, the the villain, who's kind of this bogus preacher, uh, yeah. is played by Ka- Calvin Lockhart and Judy we, Pace. We've talked about Calvin Lockhart a lot on this show, man. Yeah, <laughs> he's not he's a like stranger. a cult favorite. <laughs> yeah, I don't and, know who he is. I I look forward to that. I bet you've seen a movie with him in it called Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. A lot of people don't know he's in it. He's in a key role, though he doesn't speak. He plays the electrician. He's one of the woodsmen who they develop in the season three. 
but oh. he he's one of the few that he didn't david lynch didn't call back and like many of them then he died not long after that. yeah <laughs> oh, no. but go, go ahead chuck sorry oh just uh you know him uh judy pace who is absolutely beautiful and radiant as a uh, Deco Malley's girlfriend, Iris. Um, but of course, the big the big dogs in this are uh are uh oh god, I'm blanking. You mean the stars? Yes. Raymond St. Jacques and Raymond St. Jacques and God Godfrey Cambridge. Godfrey and his, Cambridge as Coffin Ed and Gravedigger Jones, yes. yes. And uh and they're fucking fantastic. Yeah, they're brilliant. Um, they're in, man. But uh, uh, just it plays out. I don't know. Basically, it revolves around this bogus kind of a uh, fraudulent preacher, um, Deco Malley, who shows up and does all these big sermons and is like a big community organizer and uh, is got this whole big thing about having an arc and he's got this big arc, you know, this big model boat that's painted black and, uh, like Starliner. He's going to, he's, he's going to uplift. Yeah. Kind of like Starliner, like, but uh, yeah. a little less Pyrrhic maybe, but, uh, right. He's bringing up as a, uh, kind of like this, I'm going to uplift the black community the whole time. He's basically lining his own pockets. Yeah. And, uh, somehow in the middle, in the middle of this big street, uh, sermon that he's giving there's this big attack and these masked terrorist type guys take over his truck and uh, take over his armored car and whatnot and get in this big car chase and all kinds of calamity happens the thing about Chester Himes and his novels that this captures perfectly is there are all kinds of weird kind of kind of pastiche of comical characters. I mean, Chester Himes, the thing that is fascinating about him is what an angry, jaundiced man he is. And <laughs> and as such, and yeah, he was not he was not a particularly big fan of the white man. And if you read his autobiography, the quality okay. of her, you'll understand why. I'm not either. But but uh Look, no offense guys. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, you're not all bad. Yeah, <laughs> not, 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 not a few. Are not, all right. Hashtag not all honkies. <laughs> right, not all honkies. Right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I had a flash of the Jeffersons. That guy used that word just because they could. They were getting to where they realized they shouldn't be using the N word as much as uh, Archie Bunker. So their way of getting back was like having Sherman Hensley call every white person a honky, like throughout every episode. <laughs> Go ahead. But, uh, but so there's a whole thing going where they get in this big car chase and there's all this calamitous stuff, but well, I would say, okay, Chester Himes, he just wrote these very chaotic stories, many of which just had a lot of moving parts and a lot of stuff. And just kind of the stories seem to kind of boil over like pressure cookers and explode. And a lot of stuff that would kind of went off in tangents and didn't always make sense. And you had all these weird little characters running around. Yeah, he and I feel he was he was as jaundiced about the black community as he was about anything else. And his characters, you know, Gravedigger and Cotton Ed, seem to very much reinforce that. They don't seem to like much of anyone. <laughs> and uh, they seem very suspicious of everyone. And right. usually, usually rightfully so. But eventually. Being a black was, cop back then, that was that's a hard position to be in. Yeah. That's a brilliant and, story uh, idea for 1970. And the movie does not sugarcoat that. Mm -hmm. But you get uh you get them tear assing through the streets in new york you know the, these hijacked vehicles that were previously owned by deco malley and one i think gets in a crash and burns up and the other one gets away i think uh somewhere in the chaos this big bale of cotton falls out this big bale of cotton <laughs> and it gets picked up by 
this old junk collector played by Red Fox who picks it up, throws it in his wagon and takes it away. And there starts to be this big scramble on all sides for this bale of cotton. And meanwhile, he's taking it and selling it to like some other junk dealer and then taking it back. And somehow he winds up going MIA, presumed dead. Mm. And in and in all this, you've got Deke O'Malley who's looking to uh who's looking to get this. Apparently, you find out that there's a ton of money, which basically all the money he's fleecing from the community is stashed inside this big bale of cotton. And then there's this other kind of underworld figure running around looking for it. And he's got a bunch of people who are dressed like green berets and they're all running around shooting people. And Coffin Ed and Gravedigger basically just kind of sit back. And I think he says, I think Coffin Ed says something to the effect of, you know, you know how the game is played, right? Brer Fox eats Brer Rabbit. And then the wolf eats Br'er Fox. Right. And so I guess their their whole mentality is sit back, be a wolf. Right. And basically <clears throat> they play all these people against each other until finally they're all just hanging themselves. And brilliant movie, funny movie, and just too much fun. Very influential. I mean, because that, yeah, some people because of that year, it's hard to nail the first proper black exploitation movie. But that always comes in the in top two or three. So what was the yeah. title? I didn't even catch that. Cotton comes to Harlem. Oh, cotton comes. And to when Harlem. you were learn what the t what that means, it's t you know I always thought Cotton was a character. You know, until I watched the movie, and then I'm like, oh, what a crazy. It movie. is literally a big bale of cotton. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, <laughs> like, hey, y'all, cotton know, comes to Harlem. All right. The negative inference of uh, a bale of cotton. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think Himes was too subtle, but that's okay. Um, nah, he was uh, whoops. no master of subtlety. Well, I've only been for Ray's uh, <laughs> so, so, any of you guys, other guys have any thoughts about this film? If you've seen it or like to see it or. Yeah, um whatever never seen this one but um sounds interesting it, it rolled off the back of our black cinema because i was going to do a black cinema four session with uh this new cat pd and he's also in britain and uh he got sick so he, he's kind of in rough condition and um so and i had cast it the cast is insane the cast is great yeah. and i've yeah. been talking to chuck about you know, prepping for that. And he's like, do you want to do this one? And I said, well, okay, we're going to go in a different direction, but why don't you just use it? Cause it is a crime film. Yeah. So I not like it crossover. It works in either position. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I, I, I like crossover. We, we cover a lot of movies like that, that you could put in different slots, you know, easily. Um, cool. But uh, okay. That's fantastic. Um, I was wondering, um, Justin, um, I think you told me that you had something you wanted to tell the audience to remind them of that. We talk about a lot on the show. Yes, and, and please enjoy the videos, but also don't forget to like and subscribe. And if, if you wish, uh, share the videos as well. And that'll be great if you could do that. Oh, yeah. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so, so rolling off of that, uh, I'm going to do one and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, the other three folks. Um, so uh, I don't know how many of you guys you know, I'm just feeling it out based on the average age range here, but I don't, I don't know how many of you guys grew up with Charles Bronson movies, but I mean, it could be everybody here. I don't know. You know, um, but uh, there's movies he did in Europe before he was big over here. And it's really funny when I started reading up on him after I saw once upon a time in the West, this is a number of years ago, like 20 some years ago, but I started reading more. I grew up with him because my dad was a huge fan of like the Michael winter movies, like death wish and uh, the mechanic, which I didn't see at the time, but I think it was brilliant, terrible remake with Jason Statham came out recently. No, no. Like why? Um, no. Brilliant movie though. And, and it's one of the few where Bronson actually dies at the end. Um, but uh because I think it was in his contract at some point he couldn't die at the end, you know, like Fred Williamson has that in his contract. But um, 
but yeah, I'd seen a bunch of those movies. I really liked him, but I didn't really know much about his European career. So of course, once upon a time at West was a revelation. I knew he'd done supporting in like Magnificent Seven, Dirty Dozen and stuff in the 60s. I knew he'd appeared on a lot of TV in the 50s. He was much older than most people realize he was. I, when he died, I found out how old he actually was. So he was born in 1920. So mm-hmm. let's think about let's think, think about people in our age group, the span of our age group. Uh, they didn't age as well as we do now. They looked a lot rougher <laughs> than we do when they were in their <laughs> 40s and 50s. So Bronson, it took him a long time to break, even though he'd done those supporting roles with Steve McQueen and all that kind of action stuff. And so Leone got him and amazingly uh you know he became within a couple of years he became and this they did all these polls at the time and i went back and researched it to talk about this movie but um he became the number one male box office draw in all of europe like he sold so many tickets in europe but nobody in america gave a damn about him hardly they just thought that's that guy was in dirty dozen you know but uh i did the white the um Love interest in all of his films with his wife. Yes, I'm. Yes, she's in the movie. I'm going to talk about Jill yeah, Ireland. Yeah, yeah, Jill Ireland. His yeah. wife till she passed away. Yeah, they were tight. And uh, yeah. so the the thing about Bronson, you know, so he was 48 when he did Once Upon a Time in the West, and then he when he finally got big in America it was Death Wish, 1973. So think about a 53 year old man, like he was older than my father, who was 20 years older than my mother. So, you know, my dad liked him because they were of that same generation. Like and the, he you, did Death Wish movies well into the 80s. Oh, yeah. He, he did yeah, detective yeah. movies until his late 70s. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he was the oldest detective. They kept trying to get him to retire. Yeah. And he wouldn't retire. You know, it's like, come on, dude. This isn't realistic. But then Al Pacino probably still plays cops. Too. He's like yeah. 83. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so this is one of the movies he made in Europe. So uh, Sergio Salima is this director. And... Uh, he did some really nice spaghetti westerns like Face to Face and Run Man Run, uh, but he also did an incredible crime film called Revolver with Fabio Testi and Oliver Reed, which has got a lot of like political corruption subtext, which that was latent in all the Italian crime movies. You know, every other Italian crime movie is like questioning the court system and questioning the, you know, whole. And actually, the next movie I'm going to cover later is, is like, like that, but it's, it's not Italian, but it's that that era. Um, so it's called Violent City, Lysita Valienta, and um, it came out in 1970. It came out in America in 1973 or four, I think, and they called it The Family. It was cut a bit. Um, it didn't get restored until the wonderful Anchor Bay made a DVD of it in a very around the turn of the millennium. And uh, I watched that thing to death, man. Uh, it had all the like all their restorations. It had the parts that weren't exported to America re spliced in and with subtitles under the town and you know that's now become a standard on some streaming services i was like tubi is very hip man they have a ton of movies like that like they don't they don't think you know they don't even think twice about is audience going to get confused it's like you know we're all kind of we've all kind of it's been a generation now 24 years 25 years since the age that where the internet collided with dvds and all these restorations so you know the stuff that that I grew up with and you guys grew up with, except Rhiannon, but um, you know, we, we had to really scrap for this stuff. <laughs> it, was, it, was not, it wasn't handed to us that way easily. So violent city is like, he's a hit man, of course. And uh, his name's Jeff Heston. And he has a lovely uh, paramour, you know, Murata called uh, I forgot her character's name for a minute, but Jill Ireland does play her her yes and i'm not sure if they were legally married yet at that time i think I'm not sure but it was definitely at, at the early height of their affair and then, and then they of course like she pointed out they did a bunch of movies together over the years and um the thing is though you know they kind of switch it up in this movie because in this movie really uh bronson is like the likable hitman who's had a change of heart which is an archetype, of course, that goes all through other. Like John Woo used that in The Killer. It's the, I think that he made it emblematic for a whole generation of people. Um, that, that that's kind of a, an idea that you, you you hesitate and you suddenly can't kill anymore. You know, even stuff like Unforgiven, you know, has that kind of trope. But um, so he gets that into that headspace uh, after he's been set up and sent to prison. And while he's in prison, he 
he kind of rethinks things and there's some interesting scenes where there's an, a black i was gonna say african-american but this is italy so that doesn't apply a black man uh mm -hmm. and, an, and another cat who is kind of coded as gay not in a flattering way but um and they're in the cell with him and bronson is just like steel man you know he had that stare like granite and his eyes you know and this tarantula of course this can only happen in an italian movie they're talking and all of a sudden a tarantula is on the gay guy <laughs> you know they didn't show it any any you no know, foreshadowing no idea that it was going to have this you know and he's like hold on <laughs> don't move you know and the other guys are freaking out and they then crawls over to bronson and there's a few shots where it is like a lucio fulci you can tell it's not real <laughs> something's pushing it along <laughs> but a lot of the shots are obviously real where it gets on his leg it's pretty real and bronson the actor and bronson the character just don't fucking flinch you know, he and then the thing crawls off and then he tells the other two guys, you know, very, you know, very tersely, you know, basically that there's nothing to worry about, you know, because it's fear, you know, and fear is the mind killer. So I uh, I think um, when he gets out of prison, he wants to reunite with uh, the Jill Ireland character, of course. Uh, but where is Topsy Turvy is she's really kind of the bad guy. She's really a, a very unlikable character and, and very <laughs> cruel, devious, manipulative. She's the engine of all the horrible things that happened to him through the movie, but he doesn't get, he doesn't really let it set in until near the very end. And even then he has a, almost has a trace of sentimentality for her. Uh, he just, he just keeps overlooking these things, but he does get mad. She like he'll, she out. She's kind of like, yes, she's very rich. Um, and she's very fashionable. There's some incredible clothes she wears, man. And um, he doesn't even, he and the audience don't unravel what really is going on for a while. Because when he gets out of prison, he has a lawyer friend named Steve. And Steve knows his girlfriend. And they've all known each other for years. And Bronson's like, you know, I'm, I'm retiring. I'm not going to do any hits. And people offer him all this money. He's like, that's okay. No, no, no thanks. Uh, and then he goes, and the people who set him up, this is very, um, a twist or a twist it's a plot point that's extremely similar to point blank there that's behind keith um the girlfriend and sets him up he gets shot supposedly killed left for dead etc so comes back and gets his revenge so that's that's one of the engines of the plot that's like the kind of act one into somewhat of act two and so the guy who shot him was a race car driver who's a real sleazy dude he was in the mob too and um he uh he just snipes him when the guy's you know car is going around the track at one of his little races you know and then he gets summoned by um he gets summoned by telly savalas who plays this character al weber which is kind of a ridiculous name for a character in an italian movie but i think this movie's supposed to be set in san francisco there were some location shots that you could tell and I, nobody had Italian names in the script, so I'm pretty sure this is, was a, kind of a ready-for-export movie, uh, kind of like Fulci did uh, Una Solaltra, one on top of the other, in San Francisco. Um, so, uh, <laughs> you know, Telly summons him. He's not sucking a lollipop, but he does have all these mannerisms that you associate with Telly Savalas and Kojak, you know, and, and he starts to tell the dude, you know, that he's like, I thought you were retired. You know, why'd you kill a race car driver? And he's like, that was for me. You know, of course, Bronson, <laughs> the pause, you know, it's like, that's all he has to say. And um, so he brings, uh, he wants to bring him into the fold of his organization. You know, he's always had tenuous connection with it. And Bronson's, of course, like, no, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Uh, nah, it's all right. And then he finds out the horrible truth. So not all, the first horrible truth, there's levels here. It gets worse and worse. So not only did the race car driver was actually having sex with his girlfriend and tried to kill him, but now she's married to al weber the telly savalas character so she's like this extremely rich kept woman and of course you know she complains oh he has to touch me oh it's so sleazy and i'm looking at telly savalas young telly so youngish telly savalas i'm like he doesn't look sleazy to me i don't know he got a lot of women back then i know that for a fact you know but um but in this movie he's playing a character that from the script is m the oldest character like chronologically of all the characters like he considers bronson like a kid he's like when i was coming up the mob was different you know and i'm thinking in real life bronson must have been at least five years older than him you know and i'm like he's talking to me like literally like he's like you know 25 years younger than him and 
he he does that to a bunch of characters. He's like, I'm the old guy. And like just because he's bald does I guess that's that's how to justify <laughs> casting him as an old guy. And uh so he refuses to go into this organization and they try, you know, they try all the tricks and he's extremely mad at the Jill Ireland character, and I'm wish I could remember her name on the top of my head. Uh but the thing is this is kind of of its time and people would find it objectionable now, but you know, of course, when he confronts her, he slaps the hell out of her and, you know, then practically rapes her, but then she likes it and, you know, whatever. But the thing is, uh, I don't know. She did set him up and get him killed. So, I mean, him slapping her to me is not a misogynistic thing. I mean, if the man doing it, you do a lot more than slap. Um, and, and yes, she actually did want to have sex with him, but she's not in love with him. Like, she says he is he's obsessed with her though and he just and and uh al weber's like dude man you know when he doesn't say dude but you know he's like he's like dude you know i mean when, when she gets around you, you all your strength is siphoned out you can't think clearly at all you know you're not you're not jeff heston anymore <laughs> the hitman you're just like weak and it's true it's sad it's sad it's it's power. yes he can't he you know he can hit her all he wants, but he's he's the one who's whipped. Seriously, it's sad. I um, mean, and the more ironic that they were so tight in real life. <laughs> but um, so they have a few you know torrid sex scenes. This being an Italian movie, and um, finally there's a twist that Steve, the lawyer, his was buddy, who's just kind of a, a jive talking guy. Well, first you find out he works for Weber. He works for the organization. Well, that wasn't hard to figure out. And then you find out that he's actually her boyfriend. Hmm. And that he has set this whole thing into motion. And he's really gloating about it. They're kind of like, by the time their plans start to reach fruition, they kind of can't stand each other. But, you know, um, Jill, they basically use, use Heston to kill Weber. And it's a great scene because it's one of those scenes that if it's an American movie, you know, they would sit there and then they would be talking and you tell he's about to kill him and then something would happen and he wouldn't kill him and then it'd be real dramatic, you know, and then he'd kill him. It's more like a modern movie where there's a lot of callous killing. It's, it's much more like a modern crime movie. I mean, they're talking, he's got the gun on him, but, you know, Savalas is going off on him, humiliating him. And where you don't expect it at all, bam, you know, he's dead, just blows his head, you know, and, and it's just, that's it, you know, and I, I admire that kind of, uh, that kind of courage of filmmakers to not play to any expectations. That's one thing I find refreshing about European movies. Um, I mean, in, your, in an American movie, they might not have killed him at all. They've been like, we can't kill Kojak, you know, but so he takes, a, takes the initiative and feels like he's swindling the guy and he's going to get the girl, but Steve gets the girl she gets all the fortune from Al Weber and she tells Steve, you know, basically you're an inconsequential worm. I'll retain you as my lawyer. And so by this time, Bronson has fled. The cops are after him. So I won't give away the very end, but I will say this. I mean, it's nobody makes it out of this movie alive. I will say that no, no, no speaking roles make it out of this movie alive. Um, and Bronson's mm -hmm. revenge when he finally finds out, what's happened is so beautifully shot. It's unbelievable. Like she, his girlfriend and the lawyer, they're going on out, uh, outdoor elevator, you know, kind of outside of a building. And they had kind of foreshadowed it a bunch of times earlier in the movie about how great it was. So they're going in this and, you know, as the camera pans up, you know, it's simulating the elevator going up. And then when you go on the opposite side, it's panning and he's somewhere in the rooftops. And you don't really see him, but you quickly kind of know because just all these bullets start going through the glass and filling the lawyer. And again, it's very, it's very sudden, very unexpected, weird sound when the glass breaks, totally like high pitched. And the guy's just like, you know, twitchy and it's a good death scene. And so it's like, is he going to kill her? And well, like I said, nobody makes it out. But he doesn't make it out either. So again, it's one of his kind of outliers of movie where he you know, conquers everything. But it, you know, he risked his freedom at the end. He knew that the cops were going to get him. He risked his freedom to get his revenge because he's like, you know, I did the, everything for this woman, and look at this. This is insane. And the fact that he can convey all this with like a you know very few words, you know, it's pretty amazing. So uh, this is an underrated movie. I know a lot of people who are into Italian movies have really caught on to it, especially because, like it is, Charles Bronson, Jill Ireland, Tully Smalls. But I think if any 
people of our generation grew up with is probably the family cut that was on TV and you, you'd be lucky if you saw it and it wasn't the movie as it was intended to be seen. Um, the Blu-ray set is the Vikino Lorber who continues to stun me with what their catalog. Um, and I'd been planning to upgrade it anyway for a while. And uh, I'm selling the DVD on eBay and I thought, well, God, the Blu-ray has gotten pretty cheap because Kino Lorbers are very affordable. And I, I picked it up and, it has two discs. They're both Blu-rays and it has three cuts of the movie. It has the wow. violent city, which is the main cut, which is the complete movie, but dubbed in English with most of the actors dubbing themselves like Bronson, et cetera. And then on disc two, there's like the family, the crummy American cut, which I did watch for the first time and it wasn't restored too well. They just kind of, I mean, they threw it on as a courtesy, you know, and uh, for the hardcore fans of that cut. And then they also have La city of Dialenta, which is, the exact same movie as Violent City, except it's dubbed as an export. Well, even though it's made in Italy, it's dubbed into Italian with subtitles because they dubbed everything because they didn't use live sound. I mean, people like Fellini did, but you know, n n no gr studios that grind out movies at Cinecita did a uh, live sound. Only what year? Did. What year was this? 1970. I understand that's a very good year. Um, <laughs> so nobody here seen it. I thought no. maybe at least Bill had seen no. it. No, no. I have not, I had not no. seen it, have never heard of it. Yeah, well, it needs to be rediscovered immediately. Mm. <laughs> Sounds like it. Because Bronson's great, and this this guy, Selena, in both his police and westerns, he's just so fantastic with these actors and their their stoicism that hides all this emotion underneath. Mm. Like with Oliver Reed and Revolver, is just heartbreaking. Just some amazing <clears throat> acting. And uh, again unexpected deaths unexpected twists you know you're like what the hell is going on tomas Milian was in his westerns and of course he's always great but he was really outstanding in run man run um so yeah that's that's that uh film uh, now, I, I have not seen a lot of the italian police movies but they all look great and i'm really wanting to crack into them i binged on them uh online a couple of years ago and then i went ahead and right before i became totally broke last year they had this massive Kino Lorber sale and a massive arrow sale. They're both half off. And I was like, yeah, okay. I haven't bought a Blu-ray in a year. I'm going to buy like 20, 30 Blu-rays, you know, and I bought yep. two, two Polizio Tetschi box sets. One is all Tomas Milian and Umberto Lindsay. And the other one is just various, you know? Yeah. And, and they're incredible. And and they do have like, like Rian said, they do have re rewatch value and they are kind of comfort <laughs> movies for me. You know, yeah. kind of kind of like spaghetti westerns or kung fu movies. They're like a lot of them are formulaic, but then there's ones Salimas are a cut above. Uh Ilio Petri is kind of the king of those movies. I mean, his movies kind of intersect between like a political thriller and a crime movie. And it's a beautiful nexus point. And uh Ilio Petri, I, I'm gonna cover him sometime on this channel. I don't think I've covered any of his stuff, but I think he's one of the most brilliant Italian directors like ever i mean his stuff is so intelligent and he won an oscar again a generation didn't really know all this but he won the oscar for best foreign film for investigation of a citizen above suspicion in 1971 you know which had uh gian maria volante you know who's in good the bad and the ugly and um lauren de balkan and uh that was that's an incredible movie of criterion put out but you know it, it at the time i guess I mean, or I don't want to say at the time, but since I think it has been classed like some of his movies as just a genre movie. But when it came out, it was actually internationally recognized as kind of a really hard critique on, again, the system, the justice system, law enforcement system. So, you know, these, these countries in turmoil, you know, produce some great art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Hi, you've been watching Deep Images. I'm Henry Covert, your host. Uh, this is Briggy Williams and C.F. Robbers, two of our most amazing panelists. And we've been talking about uh, a, an incredible series here. We do these series uh, sessions every so often. We break them into individual episodes. So we wanted to kind of give you a segue um, and let you know what you've just watched and what you can look forward to. So just want to remind you, thank you for watching um, and please like and subscribe um, and support the channel any way you can. Do you guys have anything to say? Yeah, like, subscribe, come back, see us. We don't bite. Type, type, type. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that? We like that.
<laughs> Let me tell you something. Leave leave some comments. Hell leave yeah. Leave something in chat. If you like us, talk to us. If you don't like us, talk to us. We want to hear from you. All right. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks for watching.